Good morning and welcome to church. We are so glad that you could be with us this morning. We start this morning as we do a few Sundays a month with confession and forgiveness, where we remember that, well, we, we don't have it all figured out yet, and we humbly admit it in front of others and in the safety of God's love and grace and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And this morning, online, the peace of Christ be with you always. If you could in the chat, type hello, peace be with you, and also with you as well. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you anointed Jesus at his baptism with the Holy Spirit and revealed him as your beloved son. Keep all who are born of water and the Spirit faithful in your service, that we may rejoice to be called children of God through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet, the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's Holy Gospel comes to us from Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you, my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. The gospel of the Lord prays to you, O Christ. So the, so the Hebrews lived in a world of injustice. Things, things were not the way that they should be. For hundreds of years, they have been bullied by bigger nations and were constantly on the run. And they, they were hoping desperately hoping for a Messiah, a Savior, to to flip the script, sort right and wrong, and change their place in the world. For close to 500 years, they they hear nothing from God, no prophets, and they are stuck waiting, waiting, and, and waiting. And then, and then comes John the Baptist, telling the Hebrews, telling the people to get ready. It is finally happening. And while John does some amazing things during his time as a prophet, paved the way for Jesus, called the people to repentance, John doesn't fix their problem. But the Hebrew people were hopeful that maybe John would grow into being his Messiah and deliver them from the oppression of Rome. Then comes Jesus, and John makes it abundantly clear that this, this is the Messiah. Not him, but Jesus. And that sorting of of right and wrong, Jesus is going to be the guy that will do it. 
His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So this is a common agricultural illustration that was frequently used in in Bible times in the biblical world. The harvest grain, the harvested grain is taken to the threshing floor and cleaned. It's, It's separated. And they would toss a portion of the harvested grain in the air with a winnowing fan. It's like a fork-like shovel. And then they would let the wind do the work. You see, the wind takes control of the process, separating the wheat from the chaff, which is a mixture of heavy husks and straw. The wheat falls away from the chaff. They don't need the chaff. It's collected and burned. And the wheat that remains and is safely stored in the barn. So finally, someone with authority and power is coming to clean up this mess that they live in. John names and claims Jesus and later saying, this, this is the one I have told you about. And to put frosting on this uh, prophetic cake, John baptizes Jesus. The heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved, and with you I am well pleased. So if it wasn't apparent before, it is now. The prologue of the story is clear. The stage is set. The author of Luke then follows up with the genealogy of Jesus to kind of root his identity in scripture and prophecy of their forefathers. And then follows that with Jesus fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. And then later in Luke follows that with a series of Jesus miracles showcasing his God-given authority in the heavenly and natural world. Luke Luke is doing his absolute best to let the reader know who Jesus is, his power, his authority, his divine appointment. Jesus needed this setup because, frankly, the Hebrew people lived a very confusing life. Their their story, their scriptures tell them that they are favored by God, important and chosen for a special mission. Yet their day-to-day lives don't seem to reflect that specialness, that importance. And then comes Jesus. Finally, after all these years, it seems like the tide is turning. We've had a lot of waiting over the last couple of years ourselves. Maybe, Maybe not as much as the Hebrew people. But it certainly seems like a lot of waiting. And our world is certainly, it's certainly a mess. I feel like the world could could use a good threshing and winnowing. It's a confusing time to live right now. And it would be nice to have God sort for us right and wrong and, and set things straight, separate the wheat from the grain and the shells from the pistachios. The hardest part for the Hebrew people to accept wasn't Jesus as Messiah, but Jesus as suffering servant. Let me say it again. The hardest part for the Hebrew people to accept wasn't Jesus as Messiah, but Jesus as a suffering servant. Because why would the God of the universe, with all the authority of heaven and earth to clean up a broken world, choose to be a sacrificial lamb? The author of Luke spends the first quarter of his book, of his gospel, showcasing Jesus' rightful place as God's Messiah through symbolism, genealogy, prophetic authority, and miracles. And then he tells his audience a story of sacrificial love, not power and might. And then he invites his readers to join in that same movement of sacrificial love for a group of downtrodden people looking for looking for a winning quarterback this really had to be a hard 
pill to swallow. Where was this Messiah who's going to lift up their people to, to set everything right? Dear love, the world we live in right now, but if being right worked to change people's minds, we'd be in a much different place right now. You, you can be right all day long and nobody cares. They don't. I don't know if you've ever looked at online arguments, Facebook arguments, everybody, everybody's right. Nobody's wrong. Everyone's their own best authority. Being right is not enough. But being loving is. I have good news for you this morning. In a world where facts mingle with fiction, where every fact is twisted and tailored to suit somebody's narrative, you don't even have to play. All you are called to do is love. You aren't called to be right. You aren't called to know everything. You are called to love and to live out loving actions. Where people are oppressed, you lift up. Where someone is wasteful, you can be thoughtful. Where someone is angry, you, you can bring peace. And instead of hating or writing people off totally, you can understand their concerns, even if you don't share them. The next few weeks are set to be confusing and tough and, and filled with that W word, waiting. We are all tired of this, and it seems like it will never end. But the fact remains, you and I have a calling to love the world and the people around us. Our calling does not change. Our creativity is stretched. Yes, we might have to think harder when we're tired. Our patience might be exercised. We might need to be more thoughtful. But God calls us to be healing, loving agents to those around us in a culture that is confusing and mixed up. But the Holy Spirit empowers us beyond our own capabilities. Jesus doesn't give us a call we cannot do, and he doesn't leave us alone to do it. The winnowing wind of the counseling spirit will enliven and empower us in all circumstances, as was promised to us in the scriptures we read each week. And it's in that trust and with that calling that we pray this morning. Creator God, Redeemer God, and God of all counsel and might, we lift up our messy and broken world. We lift up our messy and broken selves. We all feel stretched, exhausted, and, and heart sick. We need the power of your spirit to make it through another week, sometimes another hour or minute, I know I am grateful that Christ didn't come to a culture that, that had it all figured out. And the scriptures weren't given to some mystical city on a hill. It came to and through messy, broken people doing their best in difficult circumstances. This morning, we ask that you give us the strength of all that lineage of people who have come before us, living in faith all around the world. We ask for the empowerment of your spirit to help us pause, think, be loving instead of reacting in stress and anger. And we are forever grateful to be a part of your church as a refuge in the storm with an arm out for others who need that shelter as well. It's in the hope of your spirit that we pray. Amen.
say the Apostles' Creed together this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance. So we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. By the Holy Spirit, you gather your church and send it out in mission to share the good news of Jesus. Inspire your faithful people to be fervent in prayer and service. Let all people know they are precious in God's sight. God of grace, hear our prayer. You reveal your love and power through water and the spirit. Guard rivers, seas, and all bodies of water from destruction and pollution. Secure access to clean water for all and protect the land from drought and flood. God of grace, hear our prayer. Establish among the nations the blessings of peace. Raise up leaders who will protect vulnerable people in their care. Strengthen advocates who risk reputation or retaliation for the sake of mercy and justice. God of grace, hear our prayer. You protect us through the fires and troubled waters of this life. Assure us that we will not be cut off from you by illness or despair, anxiety or pain, confusion or weakness. Comfort all who are in need. God of grace, hear our prayer. We are joined in baptism to Christ and to one another. Bless those who are newly baptized and those who are preparing for baptism. Help us to be faithful in fellowship, worship, evangelism, service, and justice seeking. God of grace, hear our prayer. You created each of your saints for your glory. We give thanks for those you have called by name into your eternal embrace. Comfort us in grief and release us from fear. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O oh God, we lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us say our Lord's Prayer together. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
for our blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord, Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy, and the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.